My school day, it varies every day. Um, if we have doctor's appointments in the morning, then we do school in the afternoon. And um, my daughter tends to be very um, more focused in the evening. So she tends to actually learn better after dinner. So we do a lot of stuff after dinner. Um, we also, we do school sometimes on Saturdays. Um, we'll go to mu museums, we'll do hikes. Um, sometimes we'll do some reading. Um, it's very, it's very flexible for my school day. Um, and it's, and so I'm not forcing her to learn at a time that her brain is not ready to learn. She learns when she's ready to go. And that so. is the epitome of homeschooling. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. This episode of Homeschool Talks features a conversation originally hosted live on our Facebook page. So if you like what you hear, be sure to follow us there for more content like this. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the program. Welcome, everybody. We are thrilled to host this live question and answer. My name is Rochelle Matthew Somerville, and I am the Special Needs Consultants with HSLDA. I have six that I homeschool on my own, and I have 20 years of experience serving youth and their families in the field of early childhood special education. Joining me today is my co-laborer, uh, Dr. Sherry K. Sessions, and she is one of our newest uh, HSLDA special needs consultants. And she spent many, many years working in the pediatric phys as a physical therapist before coming to work here at HSLDA with us. She's a homeschool mom of three, two of which are deaf, and so her family uses ASL as a way of communicating. Thanks, Rochelle. Uh, we both know that homeschooling a child with special needs can be so rewarding and filled with joy, but there can be challenges too. So finding supports for those questions you run into on your homeschooling journey is so important. We're happy to be able to host this live and help you with some of your questions. Let's go ahead and get started. One of the questions that we got earlier was from um, Sheila T. And she said, uh, my twins are visually impaired and currently using a cellus for curriculum because of video, because of the video aspect and ability to make some things larger. Do you know of any other programs recommended for their disability and any software that might be a little more user friendly than JAWS or Fusion? I don't seem to be finding a lot of resources for my girl's impairment because it seems to be either braille resources that she's finding and they don't need that for their normal vision. Well, Sheila, there's a couple of resources that we actually do, um, do have that we could point you to. Um, one of them is uh, Lighthouse Guide and Bookshare, which is very similar to um, audiobooks, um, which is almost like a lending library. And that's very, very good. Um, there's also Zoom tech software, which will, um, it has a, almost a magnifying reading program that allows you to magnify. So it's not necessarily a curriculum, but allows you to take any curriculum that you have and it allows you to use uh, magnifying um, aspects of it. So you don't have to buy any special curriculum. So it also saves you a little bit of money. There are also um, Suppliers of low vision devices like computer keyboards, magnifiers, talking appliances, um, big cursors. I don't know if any of this you've already tried. Um, um, Facebook is always a good is a good place to look. Um, blind homeschooler pages on Facebook. Um, can you think of anything? Anything else? Um, I think finding your homeschool groups near you. Sometimes you can connect with other moms with. Um, kids that have the same needs and you can kind of brainstorm together and get your kids together to help encourage those kind of skills as well. Um, That's awesome. You know, audiobooks are always, always really good, um, not only for visual impairments, um, lots of disabilities um, are really good for audiobooks. Uh, uh, if you have a kid with any type of um, difficult a child who struggles with reading in any any type regardless of the disability audiobooks are really really helpful sometimes mm -hmm. just following along is really helpful for um just eye muscle uh, memory or for learning new words sight memory yeah. um yeah 
I use lots of audio books with my kiddo with ADHD and it's really, really helpful for sight word learning. Um, also for just also when you wanna learn um, fluency. Yeah. When you want kids to hear yeah. what fluency, the fluency of a regular normal pattern sounds like, listening to audiobooks is a great resource to use. Yeah. What about you? Do you use audiobooks? I don't use audiobooks, but um, with my daughter Why would who's you? deaf, that's Why okay. Would you? We use <laughs> YouTube. We use YouTube yeah. a lot. There's a lot of um, books that are being read to kids on YouTube, and there's a lot for the deaf that are signed. So I pull up stories a lot on YouTube um, for the same reasons, for the fluency of the language, for um, learning new signs and new words. So it's very similar whether they're hearing or deaf. You can use the same um, idea of an audiobook with your deaf kid or your hearing impaired kid, um, as well as your hearing kid with um, audiobooks. And you can find some of those on YouTube as well. I see a so. couple A couple people are asking, where can you actually get audiobooks for? The wonderful thing is, is that there are a lot of paid resources and then there are a lot of free places where you can actually access um, audiobooks. One of the most popular places to get audiobooks is, you know, a lot of libraries, mm -hmm. you actually have the service where you can actually get, um, you can lend, do the lending library yeah. service to your local library with just a library card. Um, but other places are um, like Learning Library, formerly known as, um, um, I can't remember what it was called, <laughs> but it's called Learning, Li I'm sorry, Learning Alley right now. There is, and there are yeah. thousands of recorded texts that are available for members. Mm -hmm. um, that's one place. Bookshare also has another really great lending library for audiobooks. Um, Loyal Books ha is a resource for audiobooks. Um, Christian Communication Worldwide has one. Kids Learn Out Loud is another one. Yeah. Um, Librivox, that's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X is another one. Um, these are some really great resources where you can find audiobooks. So there's lots of lots of different options when you're looking for um, audiobooks. Okay. Um, another question that's been asked a few times um, is, so this member has a, a child with Down syndrome and is interested in wondering to what extent they're required to cover the subjects that the states require and going into depth and how depth is really how in-depth is really appropriate. Um, and I think, I think you're exactly right to meet your child where they are. So your, your main focus is not to worry about what grade they should be in, but where they are. So if your child is learning at a first grade level, then you can teach to that level. You don't have to go into the in-depth discussions and memorization and um, uh, questions and all of that, that maybe the same content would be done at a fourth grade level. You stay at the level that they are developmentally rather than where they should be or where you would think they should be at that age. You, you go with where they are. So that's a great question. I think that's something that a lot of us struggle with. This is a really great question. Um, and the good news is, is that one aspect of homeschooling that makes homeschooling wonderful for children with disabilities is that you can offer that personalized instruction to tailor to the strengths and needs of any student. And the flexibility <coughs> with the homeschool program um, and the structure it provides is, is almost like icing on the cake. Um, yeah. You, you can provide that intentional planning, um, which involves therapies if you need to. Uh, the pacing can be adjusted. Um, the difficulty level, uh, which uh, sounds like what was alluded to in this question, um, and the breadth and depth of what you actually cover is up to you as, you know, the administrator of your homeschool. And so you can actually tailor what you need to. Now, um, while I say that, um, the bad news is, is that there is no simple and single answer to that question, of course. Right. So we can't answer it with a single answer. Um, each state is a little bit different in terms of your requirement. And so it is important to always understand your state's requirements. OK, so, of course, if you are an HSLDA member, we encourage you to contact your attorney for your state and get clarification. Um, but like I said, each state is a little bit different. So you need to find out your state requirements. But generally speaking, um, 
as Sherry Kay said, um, you want to you want to tailor to what your child needs. Find out where they are, um, and and basically uh, move your child forward in terms of what they need. If if science is difficult for your child, then you do a little bit of science. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to expose mm -hmm. your child to to whatever they can handle, but you don't want to force something on them just because it's expected, mm -hmm. you know? So this is where customizing and personalizing the curriculum is, is, um, is what we do when we homeschool, you know, that personalization is yeah. actually what makes it, makes it unique for, um, for our students with special needs. Absolutely, absolutely. I saw a question related to um, asking about how many hours should I spend homeschooling my child with autism? So this this kind of this is always a question we get um, when yes. people call in, and this goes back to um, the last question almost. And um, first of all, we're always going to tell you to fall back on what your state requires because every state is a little bit different, mm -hmm. and so you have to find out first of all what your state requires. Um, so we're always going to encourage you to, to do that. But again, um, if you are in one of those states that provides flexibility, it does depend on your child's age. So of course. Uh, younger kids are going to naturally need a little bit less than older kids. You know, um, the curriculum for younger kids is is different from older kids. You know, when you are starting off school, it's all about play. You are learning through play. This is time Absolutely. to crawl on the ground and have fun. Go out to the playground in the parks and have fun. You know, you are learning through play. And so what 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 a typical school day is going to look like is very, very different. And so the hours that you're going to engage in learning is very different. I always tell families um, it's really hard not to learn, yeah. you know, because throughout your day when you're going out to, to grocery shop and you have to put your shoes on, you know, you're learning for little mm -hmm. kids. You're learning how to put your shoes on mm -hmm. when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth for young kids. They're learning how to brush your teeth appropriately. They're learning how to put their mm -hmm. clothes on. You know, when you make a snack, they're learning how to make a snack. When you when the kids get older, you know, they're learning how to cook. They're learning how to do all kinds of things. So throughout the whole entire day. It's all about learning. And so when you're asking about the hours, um, you have to almost unschool yourself to think outside of the box. Yep. Um, get outside of that traditional, um, that school has to happen at a table from a book yep. kind of mentality. From eight to three. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Does school, your school day look like an eight to three at a it table? It does not. What does your school day look like? Um, my school day, it varies every day. Um, if we have doctor's appointments in the morning, then we do school in the afternoon. And um, my daughter tends to be very um, more focused in the evening. So she tends to actually learn better after dinner. So we do a lot of stuff after dinner. Um, we also, we do school sometimes on Saturdays. Um, we'll go to mu museums, we'll do hikes. Um, sometimes we'll do some reading. Um, it's very, it's very flexible for my school day. Um, and it's, and so I'm not forcing her to learn at a time that her brain is not ready to learn. She learns when she's ready to go. And that so. is the epitome of homeschooling. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. That's great. But that is the perfect example. Yep. So when you're asking about hours, you have to kind of put that in a box. You know, mm -hmm. that is that yep. is the session's way of homeschooling. Right. Yep, and sometimes and so, we'll do 20 minutes in the morning. Sometimes it's an hour in the afternoon. So it, sometimes it's hard to keep track of those that time. Like, oh man, I did this in the morning and that in the afternoon. I don't do it all in one sitting. Um, we don't usually sit. So <laughs> absolutely. So yeah. So what yeah. works for your family may be different, mm -hmm. you know, than Sherry Kay's family and maybe different from my family. You know, I have a teenager. And so there were times that, uh, you know, last year um, when my daughter, um, I have six kids. And so, of course, finding that individual time was really, really difficult. And so my daughter, her complaint was that I never had that individual time. And it was there was some truth to that. Um, but, you know, I was a little outnumbered. And so what we found out was that when I put all the other kids to bed, 11 o'clock at night was quiet time. That was the quiet time in the house. And she was already a night owl. I was a night owl. And so at 11 o'clock at night was when we did math mm -hmm. and it worked for us. And so you'll find 
find that when you start asking about hours, you have to kind of think outside of the box and you have to figure out what works for your family. And so when you think about it that way, first you have to think about the age of your child. You have to think about what your child can handle. I have another kid who can't handle more than 15 minutes sitting at a time. Um, and this is a 12 year old. Um, and so you just have to think about what your kid can handle and what that schedule might look like. Um, and so, Again, not a straightforward answer. <laughs> we can't give you any straightforward answers, but we give you some examples of, um, you know, yeah. what 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 a day might look like for you. So think about it that way, as opposed to saying I have to get three hours of school in, but three to four mm -hmm. hours, it, whether you do it in twenty minute chunks, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. sixty minute chunks, is a really good school day. Absolutely, you know. Um, and so think about it that way, as yeah. opposed to thinking, I have to do this before this, before this, right. before this. So, so we give you that permission. There, there you go. To you not be a, not be like we all think of school, sitting at a desk for this amount of time. You have permission to learn throughout the day in chunks of time when it's best for you and your learner. There you go. Permission granted. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Okay. Um, I see Mitch here is asking yeah. a question. I need resources on how to get professional help writing my child's IEP SEP. Um, I struggle to know what benchmarks <clears throat> to work on and how to develop them. I like not to go through the state or the local school. Okay, well, we do have a couple ideas for you. Um, uh, of course, an SEP is a student education plan, which is equivalent to what uh, the typical um, child will receive, which would be an IEP in the school system. And there's a couple starting places that you could use. Um, there are, if you have a curriculum that you use and you look in, um, for example, a curriculum guide, it will show you the skills that are worked on if you look in like a table of contents, for example. Mm -hmm. If you want to, um, if you're not quite sure, first of all, let me back up some. Sometimes I recommend that if you don't quite know where your child is, we start off with an assessment mm -hmm. um, to find out where your child is. Because what's interesting is that um, if you're just coming from the public school system, a lot of times what we believe is that our children move um, in every subject area um, in the same grade level. So for example, their writing skills, their reading skills, their math skills, science, social studies, they're all at third grade. But what you'll find out when you first start homeschooling is that that's not true. Correct. You know, I my, mm -hmm. my, um, my son, in particular, he's in 12th grade. He clearly has some gifts in math, but that's his interest. And so he tends to have more... Um, he tends to have more motivation for math, uh, more attention to math. And so he will continue through math. He will persevere. And so naturally, he is better in math than he is in, in writing. Not saying that he's behind in writing, but his skills are probably more advanced in math than they are writing. So he may be a great level ahead in math, but he may be average or maybe a great level behind in writing. OK, so we're, we're working at different grade levels and in reading, he may be at grade level. So those are three different grades right there that I may that, that if I were to purchase a curriculum that I would get three different grade levels. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not going to do that, but <laughs> but so I recommend that we first uh, figure out where your child is in terms of the skill levels um, and then work your way forward. But one way to do that is if you look at the front of curriculums or if you were to like, for example, let's take a Becca, for example, if you were to Google a Becca, you could see all the skills that are worked on mm -hmm. at each of the grade levels. Mm -hmm. And then you could work from there. You could you could say, OK, well, I think in second grade, my this is a really good skill to work on um, mm -hmm. in third grade. This is a really good skill to work on. And so you could create your SEP based on those particular skills that you think your child needs to work from. Yeah. Um, there's also um, there's also co something called the World Book, which basically does the same thing. It identifies um, the skills that are in each of the content areas based on grades. However, the only difference is between this and a curriculum is is that these skills are not um, based off of a curriculum, so they're not curriculum specific. These are just the skill levels that coincide with the different content areas. So it'll tell you in fifth grade in science, these are the skills that are worked on. You know, in, in 11th grade, these are the skills that are worked on in reading. So that might help you as a starting place for mm -hmm. 
um, coming up with ideas for your SEP. But also, if you are an HSLDA member, um, there are educational consultants that you can contact that can help you um, to actually come up with the goals and help you mm -hmm. with your SEP. So yep. remember that for our HSLDA members, we yep. are here for you to kind of help you navigate this process yep. as you're working on this document. And also in the HSLDA store is um, an assessment tool called the Brigance. And the Brigance is nice. Um, it goes through academic skills at different levels. And then wherever those skills are lacking, there's actually a corresponding goal already written for you within the Brigance. So nice. as an HSLDA member, you can um, check out a Brigance and use a Brigance and assess your, your learner. And that can help you write goals for your SEP. And like Rochelle said, the educational consultants are more than happy to help walk you through developing an SEP, using the SEP, and um, making sure that it's, it's capturing what you want to capture and what you need to capture for your learner. Ooh, lots of great questions here. Uh -huh. um, I Let's see. Um, from Michelle Hook, I see I've been homeschooling my dyslexic daughter since kindergarten and we are relocating to Eastern Tennessee. What resources are available to homeschool families for dyslexic children? Um, now that is a loaded question, my friend. Um, <laughs> we have lots and lots, uh, there are lots and lots of resources, um, of course, that's available. Um, the International Dyslexia Association has a huge website that I highly recommend mm -hmm. that you use. Um, anywhere from finding a professional, a tutor, to just just general resources that you could use. Um, they have lots of links that you could link from. Um, um, the Orton Academy has a great website that you can use. So these are not necessarily specific um, resources or curriculums, but these are uh, websites that have those links to different uh, <clears throat> different resources that you could use that are specific to dyslexia. Um, Wilson and Barton um, are also really great um, um, resources um, that you could that link to the, the actual websites. Um, and of course, we are here as HSLDA consultants to kind of help you navigate this process too, Absolutely. because there are tons of resources specific mm -hmm. to each of the disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we could ac actually exhaust it because it's more than just knowing your child's disability um, that helps us to navigate the best curriculum and resource for your child. Um, a disability is just giving your your giving us a label um, mm -hmm. because this is a, a label is almost like a piece of clothing. You know, you're, you've given us the shirt, but um, in helping you to find the, the best resource for your child, we would have to actually kind of process with you the strengths and weaknesses of your actual child. That's what we would like to know. Um, yeah. And so we would recommend that you give us a call and kind of talk to us a little bit about who your child is so we can help you to navigate. Um, does your child, for example, like repetition? You know, um, is this is this a child who just can't stand? I have one. I have twins. One can't handle repetition, and the other one needs it. And so those are those are two totally different curriculums um, that that I would recommend. Uh, one really benefits from manipulatives, and the other um, the other it just drives him crazy because he just wants to move fast. You know, and so one needs to his attention span is a little short, and the other one could sit all day and do activities. So knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your specific child is more important than a disability label. Mm -hmm. And so I challenge you to kind of dig a little deeper than just that disability because there are, res there are lots of resources for every single um, learning profile, but you have to kind of process who your child is first before we can throw out different, um, yeah. you know, different resources to you. So yeah. unfortunately, yeah, not an easy answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Along with that, um, Gina Hamilton is asking, um, we have just discovered that my son is struggling with a lot of sensory challenges and we are at the beginning of finding an OT for him to get a full evaluation. And as a former special educator, I have already put a lot of strategies in place for him, which has been extremely successful. Do you have any advice for us as we start this journey? My son is six and his learning levels range from the beginning of first grade to third grade expectations, depending on the content. Um, again, there's so many resources out there. Um, I and, and it definitely depends on the sensory challenges that your son has. 
But uh, I'd like to share with you The Out of Sync Child and The Out of Sync Child Has Fun. Those two books together explain sensory challenges really well. And then The Out of Sync Child Has Fun is a great book for lots of different um, ideas for accommodations, modifications, activities to help either calm the child or increase arousal levels to allow for attention. Um, it, they're great books. They're easy read books. They're great resource books. And I think that that would be a great place to start. Um, again, there's tons of resources out there for sensory processing. Um, you're welcome to call the consultants. We're happy to brainstorm things through with you. But I think that those two books would be a great starting place for you as you begin learning more about the challenges that your son is facing. Oh, lots of great questions. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, Rochelle Boyd says, high school is coming up for us in a couple of years. At this time, it does not look possible to complete a standard level of high school work. I know to work at the level, I know to work at this level, but my question is how to fill out a transcript. He hates school, but it's hard for him. Autism, dyslexia, I'm not quite sure, P-Y-R-O-L-U-R-I-A. Pyroluria. Uh, anxiety, ADHD. So mm -hmm. I don't see college being on the radar, but I don't know if I will need to do a certificate of completion or um, there's a way to make a transcript based on his low elementary levels. Okay, Rochelle, I have an answer for you. I like your name, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, so there, um, there are lots of high schoolers with special needs who do get transcripts. So let me say this. Um, when you get to high school, um, high school credit is determined by um, not necessarily the level of work, but it's 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 determined by the time that you work on a particular subject. So the child does not necessarily have to be working at the specific level. So, for example, um, a ninth grade student does not need to be at the ninth grade level to receive a transcript or to receive ninth grade credit for a subject. For example, um, they don't necessarily need um, to be working at the high school level in all their subjects in order to receive a high school level credit, right? So for example, um, if this child is working through high school, which we know, if you're high school, if you're homeschooling through high school, then the child is still working, right? And so you are going to give the child credit. However, your transcript is going to look a little different. So the way that you the way that you label the classes will indicate that these were not your typical classes. So for example, you won't say that for example in ninth grade the child took algebra. No. If if you have a if you have a child who's still working on basic math skills, you may call your ninth grade math basic math. Right. So this will communicate to whoever you are giving your transcript to that this was not a high school level course. And so what you're going to do is you're going to give your um, your high school courses unique labels that basically speak to what content your child did. But it's not going to look like your tip. They're not going to be labeled like your typical classes. Not it's not going to be um, algebra, calculus, you know, pre-calculus, those type of things. But it may be basic math one. It may be, you know, basic math two, which is an indication that your child did do work throughout high school, but not necessarily high school level work. Um, in saying that, so you can give your high school um, you can't give your high school a transcript. Now, whether you give them a, a transcript or a certificate is up to you. They do communicate different things. And whether you choose a transcript or a certificate really depends on what that post high school life looks like. Um, there are so uh, if, if, if your child is college bound, of course, you want to look into doing a transcript. If your child is not, but may do some type of trade school or may get a job that might look for a transcript, then you want to give them a transcript. A transcript communicates that your child completed high school. A certificate communicates that they weren't able to really complete the workload of high school. And so you have to make that decision. Um, and so it really depends on what that post high school 
um, life is going to look like. And it's up to you. And again, if you need some more support making decisions, um, we are definitely here to help you if you're an HSLD member. Um, we have we have uh, information and sample transcripts on our website that you can definitely um, take a look at. If you're looking for a template, we have free templates on our website um, that you're more than happy to use. But uh, so sometimes working with high schoolers with special needs can get a little tricky and um, you do need a little support. So I do encourage you to find find your support when you get that high schooler um, with special needs and reach out. And if you are an HSLDA member, um, be sure to um, reach out to the high school consultants. We are here to help you. Let's see, another really popular question that we tend to get is related to um, making homeschooling fun and engaging for special needs students. Okay, talk to me. How do you make homeschooling fun? What are some things you do? We use a lot of games. I um, love it. My daughter loves board games. Um, and, and to be completely transparent, <laughs> I don't particularly love board <laughs> games, <laughs> but she does. So we use a lot of games um, and puzzles. And um, that's how I, I bring in the learning. Um, she likes to be hands on. We do a lot of science experiments in the kitchen. We bake together. Um, so she would prefer to be much more play-based than um, sitting and using a book. So we find that, um, we find the ways to do that. And board games are a big one for us. So I've scoured the internet for all the math <laughs> board games and the reading games. And um, we also use a lot of physical activity. So, um, with her spelling words right now, we put them in a hopscotch. And then when she gets to the hopscotch, I will sign a word and she'll have to spell it. So she thinks that's a fun game to be able to do that. So we make it a game and we, she doesn't realize she's doing school sometimes. Very nice. Hey, that's the key. That, that is, that the, is key. the key. I love it. Um, we are a game family. Um, if I make it a game, they mm -hmm. don't know they're learning. Yep. Don't ask me why. They just don't think it's learning, <laughs> especially if I turn on the TV and it's a, you know, a, a game that involves technology or, mm -hmm. you know, a game like um, Kahoot, oh, where they fun? each have their mm -hmm. own tablet and they have to put their answers <clears throat> in the tablet. They have no clue that that's great learning right there. Um, but we are a game family. Um, all kinds of uh, math games that we have found online. Um, another thing that I found that um, encourage um, engagement for a lot of learners with special needs is letting, choosing um, student-led curriculums, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. not always being the one to, to, um, to, to be the orchestrator of everything. I let my kids choose as much as they can yeah. um, in terms of not only the curriculum, but the schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, I am always in control. They, yep. don't, they don't always know that, but I am always in control. That's so, a secret. Uh, that's another <laughs> secret. Um, <laughs> um, but in terms of their schedule, when we wake up, they kind of decide, okay, what are we going to do first maybe? Or when will we have lunch? When are we plugging some things in? But mm -hmm. it's all within my schedule that I planned. Um, I like to provide activities outside of the house. Mm -hmm. That's always important. Mm -hmm. um, so that they understand that learning can be fun. Mm -hmm. As much as I can, I take learning outside of a book. Mm -hmm. um, I We do, it's important that they learn to sit. Okay, so that's just something they have to do as an adult. And so therefore I have to give them some level of training where they have to sit down, but it's not all in a book. And so every chance I get, we're going to a museum or we're studying something and the end point is a trip to somewhere. Um, I build in flexibility in everything mm -hmm. I do. Um, yep. I think I build in more flexibility than I do a schedule to work <laughs> because mm -hmm. I know it's coming. Yep. I know it's coming. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I build in social time. You yeah. know, uh, I make sure that their learning is around others. You know, we know we homeschool and mm -hmm. I know they have their siblings, but I think it's important that they be around other kids just to know that they are not the only one in the world that homeschools. Right. right. <laughs> so, you know, that's just a few ways that I um, kind of make um, learning fun. And I think it has to be fun it in does. order to keep mm -hmm. them engaged. Yep. 
I agree. That is one thing that I do. Also, I'll have the list of things that we need to get through, but she can choose what we do first, what we do second, because in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter if we do math exactly. first or reading first? Um, so I will lay them out and let her pick it. Um, and that works quite well because she has some control and um, is ready to get it done. Absolutely. So uh, let's see. What are your thoughts about catching up? We get that question a lot. Yeah. Um, my kid is behind. How do I get them caught up? Well, I think our kids are not behind. Um, the grade levels and um, where we think kids should be ac with academic skills are a little bit arbitrary um, and set up by people. And so um, I don't look at um, grade levels for my daughter. Um, especially when I'm, because of her disability, as a deaf learner, her reading skills are so much different than a hearing child who's learning to read. I can't compare that. And I think it's the same with most kids with special needs or learning differences. Their learning is going to be different. You cannot compare apples to oranges when you're looking at the way this child is learning. Um, our goal is to get our child to their ultimate potential and they can't be behind when you're comparing them to themselves. I love it. Um, so I absolutely agree. Um, I think the idea of catching up, um, I think you have to first, when you decide to homeschool, you have to prioritize what your priorities are. Mm -hmm. And I think you alluded to that a little bit before in terms of what you have to get done. Mm -hmm. And what are those things, you know, just on your wish list that it would be great if we did mm -hmm. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Right. But the reality is we really only need to get through A and B. Right. I was just going to say that A and B are probably all we really a need. <laughs> this is what we really, this, this is where our priority lists are. But your priorities, what are your family's real priorities? And then what's just icing on the cake? I think you need to, um, when you think about catching up, I think you need to fall back on those priorities and ask yourself, what really mm -hmm. are those priorities? Um, because the concept of catching up, and, I, and I'm sure if you've seen any of my Facebook uh, lies before, you will hear me say this a thousand times. <laughs> the concept of ca catching up or um, being behind um, is really an institutionalized practice that stems from systems uh, where groups move in cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you think about it, um, it doesn't apply to homeschoolers because we are all about the business of individualizing and personalizing. And so the idea, if the idea of catching up stresses you out, then you have to just get rid of it because it doesn't apply to us. Um, right. It may be to your advantage for people to um, focus more on um, finding out where your child is, like you said, mm -hmm. um, and then moving them forward. That's your sole focus. That should be your priority. Find out where your child is, regardless of where they are, and move them forward. That is the goal. And so the idea of, um, of being behind is a concept that doesn't apply. Yes, because absolutely. Because they are right where they need to be. Yep. And I think some of our families have some kids with special needs that are much more significantly impaired. And what is important for them to be their ultimate in terms of their independence and to give them their quality of life, that's not always going to be directly related to academic skills. So sometimes our priority may actually be some sort of independent living skill, or um, maybe they need to be able to, um, you know, change out some medical device independently. Absolutely. Um, and those things are more important than memorizing the capitals of the states in terms of how that child's going to live in the future and keeping themselves healthy and um, as independent as possible. So I think it's important to look at your, your learner and what are those things that are so important for them and their ultimate and their quality of life. I love it. Absolutely. Along with that, um, Sarah Mogensen, I hope I said that right, um, is asking for some advice for homeschooling a child with special needs that is nonverbal. Um, this could be an entire Facebook Live by itself. <laughs> um, 
So Sarah, if you're a member, I would really encourage you to call into a special needs consultant and let us brainstorm some stuff with you. But I'm going to, in general, um, there are devices that are available, um, pecs, pictures. Um, there's iPad apps that can put together sentences for kids. Um, depending on the level of need, a nonverbal child may really benefit from ASL. And even though they're da- they're not deaf and they can hear, in, able, in order to express themselves, ASL may be the most appropriate way to do that. Um, so there are lots of different ideas and technology and interventions that that um, are out there. It's just a matter of brainstorming with a professional, whether it be maybe a speech language pathologist or one of us consultants at HSLDA to come up with a way for that child to express what they do know, because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of great information inside them. Absolutely. Um, And you know, the interesting thing, I was just having a conversation with somebody and um, they have um, a family member who um, they are trying to work with to get them to talk. Um, And um, the child does not speak. And what I reminded her is that it's not speaking that's important. What's important is communicating. Correct. And so sometimes we get caught up on the fact that that everyone needs to talk. And that should not be the focus. The focus should be that everyone should have the ability to communicate ideas and share information. And so um, I love the ideas that Sherry Cage just um, shared because they're all about communicating, Mm -hmm. whether it be sign language or some type of VOCA, a voice output device that allows you to share ideas, whether it be pictures, it allows you Mm -hmm. to communicate the same idea with, um, with somebody else. But the interesting thing is, is that there are a lot of tools that are available. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And like she said, this could be a whole nother Facebook live. So (laughs) definitely, definitely um, reach out to one of the educational consultants because we, we could make a whole day of that one. Yeah. We can (laughs) brainstorm with you and come up with, depending on your child's fine motor skills and um, preferences that they may have. I worked with a family once who had a little one who could not vocalize and they tried pecs and they tried iPad. And basically the child threw the book at them. They were like, I don't want this. And the child wanted to sign. So mm-hmm. sometimes you got to follow the lead of the child too. Um, so brainstorming some of those things through with someone else can be really valuable. What about the unmotivated child? Any strategies for, you ever get in a rut and your daughter just doesn't want to do anything? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got any good strategies for that one? <laughs> oh, you got to have an entire toolbox of strategies for that Absolutely. one. <laughs> There's not something that works 100% of the time to motivate um, our kids. Um, for us recently, we've actually changed up in the environment that we're working in. So instead of doing school at home, we're actually going to, um, I have to go to a meeting at a, another building. And so we actually use a conference room there during, before and after that time. And we do our, we do our math and reading, not at home, because we're not as distracted. Mm-hmm. So I've changed up the environment a little bit for this one. Um, sometimes we, I give her the choice of what to do. Sometimes I'll write them down and put them in a hat and we pull it out. Um, Sometimes it's uh, candy or ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sometimes you just have to pull it out. Yep. But Sometimes we also love out. unit studies. We love to um, pick something really fun and then use that topic to kind of pull in those other, the content areas that are that are necessary at that point. So um, with my oldest, she loved learning about culture and countries. So we pointed to a map and found a country and we did the reading and we did the writing and we did map skills and we did weather and all that stuff just by pulling a country off the map, which I really didn't care what country she chose. <laughs> it didn't matter what country it is. We're just trying to gain the, glean those skills from that unit study. I love it. I love it. So I'm sure this is one that everyone can resonate with. If you have a child, whether you homeschool or not, <laughs> 
We can all resonate with the unmotivated child. And unfortunately, sometimes they get mislabeled as lazy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily know that I would say lazy, um, but we, we definitely hit our bouts, you know, um, um, of our, our dips, what I call dips in the water. Um, but I think when we think about that unmotivated child, um, I think you have to consider the reasons possibly or the causes for the lack of motivation. And I think this is really important when you start processing um, um, lack of motivation because it's really important because there could be different reasons. Um, it could be academic deficiencies. It could be that they're just not interested. It could be they're stressed and anxious. And so therefore they have literally just retreated. It could be poor executive functioning and they just don't have the strategies. It could be medication <clears throat> that's just forcing them to take dips. And so it, it could be a lot of different reasons. And so unless you really process the cause, I don't necessarily know that you can actually pinpoint a strategy to implement unless it matches the cause. You know, if I, if I give my kid candy um, to motivate them, but the real reason that they're not motivated is because I've given them medication that then makes them sleepy, that's not really going to work. So you mm -hmm. really, really have to take your time and process the cause of, of um, the lack of what you're seeing as mo uh, um, of not being motivated. Um, for example, if you see that your kid is just stressed and anxious, it may be that um, you need to increase the predictability in their routines. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's just that they have so much going on. They don't know if work is ever going to end. You know, they may have ADHD and they just feel like mom has given me work and it just keeps coming and coming <laughs> and coming. And I don't ever know if it's going to go. And so they just shut down and they're like enough is enough. You know, so mm -hmm. that's an easy fix. You know, um, or they may have poor executive functioning and they just cannot manage their time or they you, they have medicine that they manage a uh, disability with and it just simply makes them dip. Um, they may be imitating a TV or video game, you know, because we are in a technology age. So there are lots of reasons why um, mm -hmm. our kids can be, you know, not motivated at the moment or lack motivation, but I think we have to get to the cause um, before we can process a real good strategy to actually address it. Um, but a really good resource for parents that I would highly recommend is a podcast by um, Dr. Ken Wilgus, W-I-L-G-U-S, called Feeding the Mouth That Bites You. I heard this for the first time and I was hooked. Oh. I was hooked. It's called Feeding the Mouth That Bites You. Um, you just, you're sitting there, you're just glued to your seat and like, oh. Yeah, I love it, you know. Um, and so that one's a good one. Um, also, Mindset, Mindset by Dr. Mm -hmm. Carol Dweck is a really good one um, because it just, it makes you think. It makes you think. Um, um, and one more, Hungry Minds, the, or the Origins of Curiosity. Curiosity is a really good one you have to think about um, because you want to continue to spark that curiosity in kids because that's what keeps them motivated. Mm -hmm. So if they're not curious about learning, regardless of what age, what grade, or what subject you're teaching, I, the, the motivation is automatically going to tank. So those are a couple things to think about when you're thinking about um, motivation. I see a question by Danielle Rockford. Um, was in public school with an IEP. We took him out of school and he's been in homeschool for four years. I see he needs more help. I believe he has a learning delay. Should I get him tested for a learning delay? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's always an option. It's always an option. I always say, if you suspect, then I would say yes. Um, because there has, to be, uh, there has to be some reason why you suspect um, that there is some type of learning delay or, or some type of learning challenge. And um, you probably might not be able to articulate it, but there's some reason why you suspect it. Yeah. There's just something about that intuition of a parent. Yeah. You know, there's some reason why mm -hmm. you're thinking it. And so um, you would rather have more information, even if that information says, no, he's fine. Fine. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. You know, I would rather hear, nope, he's he's I can't find anything. It looks like he's doing well. Then fine. Let's move on. It must be motivation. Yeah. And you can still make changes. But 
um, more information is better than no information because then you're left to continue to guess. So I would definitely say, absolutely, yeah. get as much information as you can so then you can move on to if there's still issues and you're not um, you're not producing your son is not producing what he needs to, you can move on and, and try something else, but at yeah. least you'll have the information you need. Yeah. Many parents are scared of a label or nervous to place labels or limits on their kids that might come from that sort of testing. And I agree with Rochelle. I think that the information that you glean from getting those, that information, the diagnosis, or even just some of the, um, learning styles and learning preferences that come along with those testing outcomes will help you figure out how your child learns and the ways to support them, any accommodations and modifications that might need to happen within your daily life. The information that you glean from those tests and assessments can be really um, helpful as you plan out the way you're going to present the material to your learner. And remember too, when it comes when it comes to labels, um, as Sherry Kay said, a lot of parents are afraid of labels. But the thing to remember about labels is is that if you get your child diagnosed, you decide what to do with the label. Absolutely. You don't have to your child does not have to wear it like a Superman cape. No. It is up to you who gets to know what your child's label is. Mm -hmm. So if that's something that you want to keep private, then that's just something you keep private. Um and so if you choose to share it, even this goes as far as even family members, mm -hmm. um, it is totally up to you to let people know your child's being tested. And it's totally up to you to let anybody, including your family, know that your child was diagnosed with a label. And so um, don't be afraid to um, get as much information that you can about your child. And the other thing is, is that a label is like a shirt. It's something mm -hmm. your child has. It's not who your child is. Yes. And so remember that too. And so it's just something extra that a little, a little a additional piece of paper that your child has, something else that you're going to learn about your child. It's not who your child is. You know, after you have that label, you still have to figure out who your child is. Mm -hmm. So your child has ADHD or your child has autism. Now, who is your child? So yep. just be aware of that. Yep. The label doesn't change who they are. Absolutely. They are organically who they are with whatever learning challenge they may have, but it doesn't change who they are. Absolutely. So we're going to answer one more question because we are nearing an end. And so do you see a good question? There's so many good questions here. Okay. So... I think what I'm getting here is wondering if educating um, a special needs learner through high school, if it can only go past four years or go four years, can it go longer um, in the public school systems? Often there, there are programs in educational services through 21. Um, unless you're in Michigan, it actually goes until 26. Um, so Yes, you can continue to educate your child past their senior year. You can also take five years or more to complete the high school curriculum or high school activities that you um, have set forth. Um, we have some great transcript templates on our website to capture that when you go past a traditional four-year um high school career. So. Yes. Um, Nikki, uh, Nikki, Nicole, I see, I, I do see your question. Um, to get started, I know I'm to complete an annual declaration of intent, intent for the state of Georgia. Once completed, what is my next steps and can we homeschool the entire year? Um, Nikki, that is an, that is an awesome question. And each state has their own set of rules. And so um, if you are an HSLDA member, we have amazing legal attorneys who know um, the laws in each of the states. And so I would encourage you to call and speak directly to your legal um, assistant or your attorney to get all of your answers related to the requirements in your states, because mm -hmm. each of the states are different. 
And we do not claim to be experts in all the states because they are so different. Yes. And so we are going to defer you to your um, your legal attorney for that one in your state. Yeah. Um, but so one last question for you. Mm-hmm. Any final tips or strategies that parents can incorporate for their students? They're wiggly learners or students with ADHD. I, I saw that a couple times. Mm. I think, um, or just students with special needs in general. I think one of the hardest things for me and a lot of parents is we want our kids to match our teaching style. And I think it's really important to remember that we need to match them. Um, One of the things my daughter likes to do is sit on one of those big exercise balls Mm -hmm. while she's reading (laughs) and she bounces and it kind of makes my stomach a little bit we queasy. Drive you crazy? Yeah, kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> but she can focus better and she learns better when she's bouncing on this ball while she's reading. It really I, I don't know how she does that, but she does. And so I need to take a step back and say, this is what she needs in order to read and in order to focus. So I think I think my biggest um encouragement to families is like Rochelle said, learning doesn't have to happen at the table. And to give yourself permission to allow learning to happen in ways that are very outside the box. And I think that there's a lot of decrease in frustration and stress and worry that you're not getting where you need to be when you take that off and you're, you'll see your learner just thrive doing what they need to do in the way that they need to do it. I think that's great. Um, I think one of the things to piggyback off that would be to create reasonable expectations. Um, And when I say reasonable, I mean, you have to take into account the age Mm -hmm. of your child, um, the time, the activity, the difficulty, the complexity, the required focus. Um, So all of that take into account when you're talking about expectations for your child, because it's not going to be the same for every child. This is what you're talking about, that personalized, um, individualized programming for every single child. And um, be consistent, be patient, um, you know, match your child Mm -hmm. as opposed to expecting your child to match you and outsource. What is outsource? You know, find others, find others when when you just feel like you you are exhausted. Mm -hmm. Find another mama or find another family or, you know, find another group, find your support group to kind of help you out and tag in. Um, You know, lean on your lean on your other homeschool families or your family or somebody to kind of help you. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, Homeschooling is not easy. No, it's not easy. No. So we just want you to know and be encouraged um, to know that um, the educational consultants at HSLDA are here for you. We'll be happy to brainstorm ideas with you, chat through things, and and um, help you just figure out how to get through the next day. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us and all of your questions. If we weren't able to get to your question, please know that HSLDA does have many resources on our website, including other webinars on a variety of topics that you might find to be helpful to you. We'll post a link to those in the comments. Um, So yeah. In addition to our website resources, um, I also want to let you know that the HSLDA members have access to a great team of educational consultants uh, to help you answer your questions about all your kiddos and um, We have consultants who specialize in helping parents who have questions about homeschooling, preschool through eight, all the way through high school, and they are ready to help you tackle all of your challenges. Whether it's finding a math curriculum, um, clicks for your child, or making four year plan for high school, we are here to help you. So thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day. Today's program is made possible by HSLDA's team of educational consultants. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the number of curriculum options to choose from? Or maybe you're frustrated because your child is struggling and you're not sure what to do next. Our educational consultants can help. As an HSLDA member, you have access to customized practical guidance on everything from lesson planning and record keeping to helping a child with learning difficulties. If you want to experience less frustration and more progress in your homeschool, get support from our educational consultants by becoming a member of HSLDA. 
Learn more at hslda.org slash join. That's hslda.org slash join. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you enjoyed this conversation, leave a review to let us know what you think. To hear more conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to this podcast or head on over to hslda.org slash podcast for more inspiring stories and awesome ideas about homeschooling. That's all for today. We hope you enjoyed the program and we'll see you next time.